coming and welcome to our seminar in the uh, uh, doctoral <laughs> courses on statistics, optimization and applied mathematics. It is my great pleasure for me to introduce Professor Gerard Beer. Uh, I, I, in introductions, I always like to say some numbers. So uh, I found in my sign uh, this morning 146 power centers, <laughs> uh, 2,245 sites, um, almost 400 of his book, uh, Topologies on Closed and Complex Closed uh, Sets, which is a, a very fundamental book on the subject. Uh, the book is from 93. Uh, yeah. We, I think the first time we used it uh, was in 99. And we, we used it from time to time, so it's a very good book. And, uh, well, um, he, uh, you already gave a talk uh, three years ago, so some of uh, us uh, already know him. And uh, it's our great pleasure to, to have you here. So uh, we are yours. Thank, thank you, Juan. It's, it's uh, great to come back. and to LJ and, and to the uh, general area and to see old friends and, and to make new ones. And uh, this is the first time I've been filmed and uh, my wife is a, uh, an actress and I live in Los Angeles, you know, Hollywood and all this, and she's an actress and, and a game show queen. And she's been most recently on uh, Let's Make a Deal, if you know this uh, television show for the third time. Uh, she will be on June the 1st uh, of next year. So I, I get to join her for the moment. <laughs> Maybe this will be the only moment. Um, today I'm going to talk about uh, some, some really basic analysis. I'm going to talk about real functions defined on the metric space. So all spaces are metric spaces. And this covers work in two papers. The first is with uh, uh, Sam Nampali, who was, you know, is, he, he was a topologist and maybe uh, the best of the Indian topologists, and he passed away uh, two years ago. And uh, the, I, I was pleased to talk about that work uh, at the, uh, uh, in Bombay, where he was from, uh, two years ago. And then the other work is, is recent. It's, it's accepted in uh, set value and variational analysis. Uh, with uh, colleagues from uh, Complutense, who you may know or may not know. So the paper has, t the talk has two parts, because there's two papers. And so first I want to just set forth some notation. So a metric space will always consist of um, <coughs> at least two points. Uh, r to the x will be the real valued functions on x, c of x r, the continuous real functions, u c of x r, the uniformly continuous real functions. Uh, the usual notation um, for a ball, the usual definition of diameter of a non-empty subset, Um, then the uh, usual notation from the distance from a point to a no non-empty subset, usually the distance from a point to the empty set is infinity, but I don't need that. And then an idea which you probably haven't seen, many of you, the idea of the isolation of a point. The isolation of a point is the distance from the point to the remainder of the space. Okay, so if the point is a limit point, you have arbitrarily close other points, so the isolation is zero. And we'll denote the set of limit points in the usual way, the way I, that we do in America at least. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, uniform continuity of a product of real functions, but first I want to uh, talk about uh, the idea, a classical idea, function oscillation. And I'm not going to do anything new or different here. Uh, it can be used to explain both continuity and uniform continuity of real functions. Many things I'll say will be true for more general functions, 
functions between metric spaces, but here all functions are real valued. Okay, so how do we talk about uh, uh, oscillation of a function at a point. So I have a function, a real valued function f, a point x. And I want to talk about the oscillation of the function at x. So for each uh, positive integer n, I talk about omega n f x. So it's the diameter of the image of the ball of radius. I can give you a copy. You don't have to copy any of this. I can give you a... I'll give you the paper, I'll, if, well, for fun, okay. You, you can do it if you want to do it for fun. Uh, it'll be the diameter of the image of the ball of radius 1 over n. And so the larger n is, n is the smaller uh, this uh, diameter gets. But it may be that this is infinity for, for each n. For example, if I have f of x equals 1 over x except at the origin, and let's say 0 at the origin, then all of these things uh, will be infinity, okay? And uh, as I let n go to infinity, uh, this is the oscillation. And it may be an infinite. So, whoops, I don't like this. Okay, so properties of os oscillation. First thing, oscillation f is fixed and the x is varied, varying. Oscillation is an upper semi-continuous extended non-negative valued. Uh, the second point, this is a basic point of analysis, but somehow it just doesn't get covered in undergraduate analysis in the United States in typical books. Uh, f is continu- it used to, but not anymore. Continuity to point means the oscillation is zero. And then here's a point which uh, you know, it doesn't seem to be so well-known, but I, I don't know, it's been well-known to me. Uniform continuity means the approximate oscillation functions converge uniformly to the zero function. So you see this in spate, because you're nodding your head. Okay, so we're going to talk about point-wise products. Sometimes I'll just use the word product of real-valued functions on x. So if I have... Uh, two continuous functions, the product of two continuous functions uh, will be continuous. You prove this to all of your first year students and very few understand it, but you try. <laughs> and then for uniformly continuous function, that's just not true if, even if one is bounded. So if I have uh, the sine function and the identity function, they're both one Lipschitz, so they're uniformly continuous. Uh, but x sine x is not uniformly continuous. This is the example that's usually given. But if you have uh, two um, bounded uniformly continuous functions, then the pointwise product will be uniformly continuous. So this is a standard exercise and analysis course. And the way this is proven is using this inequality. And this involves adding and subtracting something to the uh, left-hand side, and then you break it like this. So you re recognize this from your class. Now, for all counterexamples that I'm going to do, or for all examples I'm going to do, I'm going to work in a particular metric space. It will be a metric subspace of a line, which I call the shadow space. So you have the integers, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so forth. Then you shadow them by 1 and a half, 2 and a third, 3 and a quarter, and so forth, okay? So this is what I'll call the shadow space. So in terms of uniform continuity of a product, there are, there are two basic questions to be asked. The first one is, it's possible that I talked about this either here or at Alicante at some time, but anyway, I can't, you've, you've forgotten if I've forgotten. Uh, the first question is, for a particular pair of uniformly continuous functions, f and g, what are necessary and sufficient conditions for the product to be uniformly continuous? That's one question. Mm -hmm. The other question is, what are you necessary and sufficient conditions on the structure of the metric space itself 
so that if you take any pair of uniformly continuous functions, the product is uniformly continuous. Okay, now this, for whatever reason, the second question has attracted more interest than the first. And uh, the second question, you know, there are people like Sam Nadler who have, if you know this name, who've written on this thing. But it's amazing that there were no satisfactory answers to either question uh, before this decade. And so uh, I'm going to talk about answers to uh, both of these questions. I'll talk about the first question first. So this involves work with Nampali. It's always better to use this. All right, so we want to give, we have f and g being real valued functions on an arbitrary metric space. And we want necessary and sufficient conditions on the pair f, g, such that if f and g are uniformly continuous, then, then the product will be. And the conditions we're going to give turn out to be always sufficient for any function pair. They don't have to be uniformly continuous. And they're necessary for a class of pairs which properly include pairs of uniformly continuous functions. Am I talking too fast? Am I talking too fast? So, it's okay. Okay, so I want to describe this class of function pairs which will be the key class. And I call it delta for no particular reason. And membership to delta for a pair of functions fg is characterized by a uniform joint oscillation condition. Okay, so if I have uh, a function pair fg and a positive delta, I define lambda of fg of delta to be this supremum, where x and p are delta close. Okay? So f is varying and g is varying, and I look at this product. So it may be that while one is varying a lot, the other isn't varying very much for two points that are close. And so you might get a kind of a cancellation or intermediate thing. And then I let delta go to zero. And if this limit is zero, then it means that f and g belong to delta. Well, that's clear if f and g are both uniformly continuous. But it's also true, for example, if f is uniformly continuous and g is bounded and otherwise badly behaved. It turns out that delta can be described, membership to delta be can be described in terms of traditional oscillation as I presented it. Um, so it turns out that a pair belongs to delta if and only if the limit of this supremum is zero. So I look at the products of the approximate oscillations, and I want, uh, well, I, I don't know if I should say any more. I'll just let you look at that for a second. Now it turns out in one direction this is easy to prove. Uh, if I assume uh, this condition, then uh, membership in delta follows, follows easily. But the other way is not so easy. It's surprisingly tricky. And the reason why is that when you're looking for uh, uh, estimators for uh, being in delta, you just use two points. Where when I work with these, I have to work with four points. And it's hard to go from two to four. It just is. Uh, so I want to give you an example now of a function pair in delta where neither function is uniformly continuous nor bounded. You know, I, I mentioned if it's one is uniformly continuous and the other is bounded, that's fine. And we're going to be working in our shadow space. 
Now in our shadow space, you have a discrete topology. So every function is continuous. Each point is isolated. So these are, all the, all the examples will involve uh, just continuous functions. Okay, so there's f and g. So neither f nor g is, is bounded. And neither is a uniformly continuous, because you have points here which are arbitrarily close, uh, where you have arbitrarily large distances between function values, and same for this. So this, is a, this function is alive at uh, uh, two, two and a third, four, four and a fifth, six, six and a seventh. And the other function's dead there. And you have, for the other one, the same kind of thing, but at the odd, odd integers. And as, as soon as, you know this, this thing I wrote down, lambda fg delta, as soon as delta is less than a half, then this lambda fg, del FG delta is zero. And so you're gonna get uh, uh, zero in the limit, of course. But, uh, where am I here? What do I wanna say? So the, the, the it a pair of, of uh, this is a, p a pair of functions which is uh, uh, in delta. And also I should say uh, um, that it happens to be that the uh, product of the two functions is, is uh, zero. Turns out that membership in, in delta is not uh, uh, sufficient for the product to be uh, uniformly continuous, but it uh, turns out to be necessary. No, 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 it's not necessary. <laughs> it, it, it's, I'll just say that it's not sufficient. Okay, so, so the idea in this example is we have wild oscillation, you know, at certain points for one function, but the other function corrects it because it's dead where the other one's wild. Okay, so our necessary and sufficient conditions amount to, so again, we want necessary and sufficient. The basic question here is, suppose I have f and g being uniformly continuous. Uh, when is it the case that uh, f times g is, is uh, uniformly continuous? So our necessary and sufficient conditions amount to a continuity notion for a pair which is stronger than uniform continuity of the pair. But for uniformly continuous functions, it's the same thing. So I have f and g real valued functions will say that the function pair has an emphatically uniformly continuous product provided for every epsilon there exists a delta. That's how all math things work. Such that if x and p are delta close, don't think of p as being fixed. You might as well think of them as being x1 and x2. Then this weighted average is epsilon close to this particular product. Interchanging p and x is you get the same definition. Okay? Looks like an add and subtract thing. <laughs> so I want to uh, give you a pic picture of a, a continuous bounded functions whose product is uniformly continuous but not emphatically uniformly continuous. This is really easy. So in other words, uh, 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 this is not the same as uniform continuity in general. Couldn't be a simpler example. All right, so one function will be one at each integer and minus one at each shadow point. And the other function is the other way around. The other function is minus the first function. So, so if I let uh, xn and pn be uh, uh, the uh, nth integer and its shadow point, 
then if I compute this here, in both cases, I get minus one. Excuse me, I get one. So here, here I get one times one, and the other I get minus one times minus one. So if I take the average of those, I get one. Whereas if I have xn and gn, these are, can be made arbitrarily close, f of xn, g of xn is equal to minus one. So the difference between the two doesn't go to zero. And so you don't have this emphatic uh, continuity of the product. But you have uniform continuity of the product. What's the product? What's the product of f and g? Minus one. F times g is minus one at each point. So it's constant. <laughs> well, it is, and it's uniformly continuous. So uniform continuity doesn't imply emphatic uniform con continuity, even if both functions are continuous and bounded. So here's what we th saw as our main result. <coughs> emphatic uniform continuity factors into membership to delta and uniform continuity of the product. In particular, if you have emphatic uniform continuity, you have uniform continuity of the product. So another way of saying this, some people might like this better, uh, If you have a metric space and a pair which belongs to delta, then its uniform continuity is equivalent to emphatic uniform continuity. You might think of that as the main result. But in particular, if your function pair consists of functions which are both uniformly continuous, then the pair belongs to delta, and you get uh, an answer to the, to the question that we were looking for. So in, for a pairs of functions which are both of, which both of which are uniformly continuous, uh, uniform continuity of the product is equivalent to emphatic uniform continuity. Now my belief, I think I, I always talk about God when I talk about mathematics, but God cares about his or her mathematics. And I, I think this idea of these function pairs having uh, 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 being along to delta can be useful for some other things. But I don't, know, I don't know of any other things at this time. I wish I did. So now we'll go on to the, the part of the talk which to me is a lot more interesting. <coughs> the second question. Okay, so the, what I'm gonna say now appears in, in, a, in a very recent paper. Um, But the result that, the part that deals with uh, uh, this question that we're talking about was resolved first, uh, maybe six months, eight months earlier by Cabello Sanchez from, uh, well, from the University of Extremadura. There, there are two Cabello Sanchez. Uh, they're brothers. There's Felix and there's Javi, okay? So Felix is the more established guy. He does some functional analysis, yeah? And they had a very interesting situation in that Felix was the thesis advisor for Javi. This is very interesting for me. Okay, so the, our result here again is a, 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 a rephrasing uh, of, of Javi's result. It's really Javi's result. And so this is 2017. It's a basic question. You'd think this should have been resolved 100 years ago. And uh, our necessary and con sufficient conditions involve equality of two Bornologies on the metric space. So I, I view myself at this time in my life, people used to think that I was interested in hyperspaces, topologies on spaces of subsets and this kind of stuff. But I think of myself now as a Bornologist. Sounds like... 
Pornology sounds like pornology, you know, so people joke about this. What is the word for pornology in, in Spanish? Pornology. You don't know what I mean? Porno no, 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 it's not pornology, it's a pornography, pornography. Oh. Yeah, okay, so maybe it sounds uh, maybe a little uh, uh, d dangerous, you know, it's, it's not. So uh, pornology is capture the large structure of a metric space. You know, when, when, when we do analysis for most of us, we, we, we work uh, locally. You know, whether it's continuity or differentiability or metric regularity or whatever, it's epsilons and deltas and what happens near a point. But there's a large structure out there too. And that's what I'm interested in. I'm interested in analysis connected with large structure. This is not topology. If you could talk about a Bornology on any set. So a Bornology is a family of subsets that contains a singletons that is stable under taking finite unions and which is hereditary. A subset of a set in the Bornology is again. So uh, the smallest Bornology consists of the finite subsets. It contains a singleton, so it contains the finite subsets. The largest is the power set. But there's all sorts of stuff in between. So for example, what is a, what is a Bornology in between? You tell me, in a metric space. Bounded. The metrically bounded sense. I mean, Bornier's is French. Uh, so you think, well, bounded, metrically bounded sets. The metrically bounded sets are the first example, non-trivial example, of a Bornology. I'm going to list some Bornologies in a metric space in decreasing size. And this is not a complete list, but just to give you a flavor. Yes, I'm writing a book on Bornologies. If I could ever finish it. So we start with the metrically bounded subsets, BD of X. The next on the list are the so-called Bourbach key bounded subsets. Okay, Bourbach key bounded, sounds French. It is. <laughs> but no, it actually isn't. So a Bourbach key bounded means this. He said A is Bourbach key bounded, provided you can find in the metric space, for every epsilon, a finite, call this that A, a finite subset F sub A, such that each point of A is joined to some point of this finite subset by uh, an a, a epsilon chain of uh, bounded length. That's what the n is, is the number of links in the chain. Now this, uh, this idea is a really a uniform idea and, and it appears as such in the uh, bourbach topology series. But I've been told the idea goes back to von Neumann. I don't, it's what I've been told. And then, even smaller, the totally bounded subsets totally bounded in the usual way. For each epsilon, there's a finite <coughs> subset of the space such that uh, uh, you can, uh, looking at the epsilon balls, the epsilon neighborhood of this uh, finite subset, it contains a set. Uh, in, in, in this case here, uh, you can see this is a special case of two, where you can always take n to be one. There's a ch there, there's this finite set such that there's a chain of length one to any point in the set. Okay, so this is a more restrictive uh, condition. Then you have uh, relatively compact subsets. Smaller and smaller. These are all Bornologies. The compact sets aren't a Bornology because a subset of a compact set is not compact. Closed subset is. I want to talk a little bit about, I want to talk about ideas a little bit in this talk. Bourbach key bounded, I mean, have some of you never seen, have you all seen Bourbach key bounded? No, you've never seen it. So where does this come from? This is what I'm, 
I, I, I'm talking to Maria Jesus here if I'm not talking to anybody else, okay? So I want to talk about where I think this idea comes from and why it's important. So if you have an infinite dimensional norm in your space, the unit ball is never totally bounded, right? This is a characterization of infinite dimensionality. But it's Bourbaki bounded. You can take the finite, take, take the unit ball, you can take this finite subset to be one point, namely the origin. Right? From any point, for any point in the, in the, in the unit ball, there's a, and given epsilon, there's a chain of a bounded length going from the origin to the center. Okay? Now, to this, for this to be a, a Bornology, if it's going to be stable and are taking finite unions, you may not be able to use the same point. So that's why the definition involves finitely many points instead of just one point. I mean, the idea of one point is, is a fine idea too, but it's not, born, it's not a Bornology. Okay? So that's why this, you know, Bourbaki bound looks very weird, but it, it gives uh, uh, the unit ball or norm linear space more distinction than just boundedness. Okay. Now, one thing that's interesting, you know, when you, when you do analysis or topologies, you, you sometimes like to express I structure of a space in terms of uh, the continuous functions in the space. You like to do stuff like this. I know. <laughs> and so let's talk about how each of these Bornologies can be expressed in terms of uh, boundedness of real valued functions on the space. So a s subset of a space is metrically bounded if and only if each Lipschitz function is bounded on it is bounded. Globally defined Lipschitz function. A function is Bourbaki, a set is Bourbaki bounded if and only if each globally defined uniformly continuous function is bounded on it. And a lot of people like to think of Bourbaki boundedness in this sense because it's, I don't have to talk about epsilon chains or any sort of technical condition. It's just a subset such that each uniformly continuous function is bounded on it. And then um, totally bounded corresponds to the boundedness of each so-called Cauchy continuous function on it. You know Cauchy continuous function? It's one to match Cauchy, Cauchy sequences to Cauchy sequences. That implies continuity. And then relatively compact, a set is relatively compact if and only if each con just continuous function is bounded on it. Okay? So this, this is a reference of uh, three is a reference, a more general reference to uh, these things, uh, f which is a paper by uh, Mary Bell Garrido and uh, me. Uh, that, that well, we, were, we have been very interested in locally Lipschitz functions. Classes of locally Lipschitz functions. You know, every, there's lo for many analysts, there's locally Lipschitz and then there's not locally Lipschitz. But within the locally Lipschitz functions, they're, just, they're interesting class, subclasses, especially the so called Lipschitz and the small functions. Have any of you heard of Lipschitz and the small? Well, some, some I'll tell you about that. Amazing, amazing class of functions. I could have talked about those today, but I didn't. Okay, so. I'm ready right now to go to our theorem, the main theorem, okay? So the main theorem says that a product of uniformly continuous functions is uniformly continuous if and only if something goes on in X, okay? And what is it that goes on? What it is is that the Bourbaki bounded sets coincide with a, a Bornology which is in general larger. This is a new Bornology, which I discovered, I don't know, not that long ago, six, six months? No, I don't know, eight months ago or something. I don't know, doesn't matter.
This larger Born analogy consists of subsets that such that whatever I take an infinite subset of it, the isolation on that subset is zero. The, the, excuse me, the, the inf of the isolations is zero. Okay? So that doesn't say that there's limit points necessarily, but there, there are points which are arbitrarily non-isolated, smallly isolated. Well, if you look at the real line, for example, I mean, uh, any subset is, uh, is going to have this property. And the Bourbaki bounded sets are just the bounded sets in the real line. So if this doesn't work in the real line, and of course it doesn't work because the product of two real valued continuous functions on the real line, real valued uniformly continuous functions on the real line, need not be. Okay, so you don't have equality there. You have to prove that any Bourbaki bounded set looks like this. I'll tell you what, how Cabello Sanchez said this. He did, he did, at the time, he didn't work with Bernalogy at all. He said, a metric space has this property, if and only if, whenever you take a subset of the space, it's either Bourbaki bounded, or it has an <coughs> infinite uniformly isolated subset. That's how he said that. And there's a name we give to sets that, that belong to this Bornology. It's a mouthful. This is hard. We call a set in this Bornology infinitely non-uniformly isolated. So, so if I have an infinite subset, it can't be uniformly isolated. That's, that's what we call it. What has happened here? And, you know, I, I discovered this Bornology when I was looking at the following question. I knew that, and this is a basic theorem in analysis, that if you have a function which is uniformly continuous on each relatively compact set, and even on sequences, this is true if and only if the function is continuous. So continuity is cor corresponds to uniform continuity on a certain Bornology. With the Cauchy continuous functions, I knew that Cauchy continuity is characterized by uniform continuity on each totally bounded set. So I thought, well, maybe global uniform continuity could be characterized by uniform continuity on some proper Bornology. And that's how I came up with this thing. I don't know what uniform continuity on each Bourbaki bounded set means. When I say I don't, nobody that I know knows. It may have some special continuity, correspond to some special continuity property. I'd like to know that, but I don't. So there, there are all sorts of related results, and I, I just wanted to uh, talk about one uh, because it, it introduces some ideas that some of you may have not have seen, which are interesting in analysis. Uh, so, you know, this, this last theorem says when the Bourbaki bounded sets, uh, 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 you can look at it this way, when the Bourbaki, it gives conditions for the Bourbaki bounded sets to coincide with this, this new Bornology. Oh, I should say also that once you have uh, stability of pointwise products, and then the uniformly continuous functions form a ring. So it may be that is the, the way you want to talk about the property, that the uniformly continuous functions form a ring. So another condition would be when the smaller Bornology, uh, the totally bounded sets, agrees with this uh, uh, new Bornology. And here the idea of UC space comes into play, which uh, this is why I wanted to introduce this, because this is your, it's a basic idea in analysis, which you know, is in no analysis books. So a UC space is one such that each continuous function on it is uniformly continuous. Okay, it's a UC space. Well, in an analysis course, you prove that if you have a compact space, then each continuous function on it is uniformly continuous. But that doesn't characterize 
compactness. For example, if I take a look at the uh, integers as a subset of the real line, then each function defined on the integers is going to be uniformly continuous. And that's certainly not compact. Okay, so there, there's some something that, that ought to, of course, you know, be character, some structural property of the metric states that ought to be uh, characteristic Japanese mathematician Atsuji in the Pacific Journal of Mathematics, which used to be a highly thought of math journal and was highly rated on your list, but I guess uh, it is not so much anymore. Okay, so these are characteristic properties of UC spaces. And you, when you see these, all of these properties are true for compact spaces. When you do a, uh, an analysis or topology course, you prove that a compact space, for a compact space, each open cover has a Lebesgue number. Which means if there's a number lambda such that if I have a subset, which has diameter less than lambda, it sits in one of the sets of the cover. It's not characteristic of compactness. Second condition, whenever xn is a sequence in x, where the isolation goes to zero along the sequence, then it's clusters. For compact space, all sequences cluster. But only certain ones do in these spaces. The third one is something that I think is new to, to our paper. The uniformly non-zero functions, uniformly continuous non-zero functions, are stable under inversion, reciprocation. I don't know if that's a word, but you understand what I'm saying. That's kind of a nice property. Then four is something that, you know, when you're teaching metric spaces, you certainly do for compact spaces. Whenever you have disjoint closed sets, there's a positive gap between them. Okay, again, not characteristic of compactness. But none of these conditions say what such a space really looks like. I mean, you know, these are just theorems, you know. You know how, how can I look at something and tell that it is? And the last condition tells you. Either uh, in condition A, uh, the space is uniformly isolated, like, like the integers is a subspace of, subspace of the real line. Or there are limit points But if I stay away from the set of limit points by a little bit, in other words, for any epsilon, if I'm outside the epsilon neighborhood of the set of limit points, what's left outside is uniformly isolated. Okay, you can see what that looks like. Let me give you a non-trivial example, which you'll, you'll like. This will be an example in little l2, okay? So I'm gonna give you a a UC space, and UC subspace of little l2. So we'll use the l2 metric. So uh, x will be, <coughs> what, what would you like me to write as uh, the, the origin? I like, I, like, I like this symbol, I just do. That's the origin, union, one over j, e, n, j, n, 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 N. Okay, I call this the constellation. So you have the origin. The origin is the only isolated, uh, the only limit point. And then you have your orthonormal base out here. And then you have similar points a half out, similar points a third out, similar points a quarter out, like that. So you, this is what I, maybe I could call it the solar system, but I, I like to call it the, the uh, constellation. Oh, speaking of solar system, I have to say this to you. Uh, one of my great experiences of my life happened this year. I saw the solar eclipse of the, uh, the lunar eclipse, the, so, the eclipse of the sun, uh, live uh, in the United States, total eclipse of the sun in a state called North Carolina. This is great. Okay, so if I take a look at, the, at, at this space here, the only, limit po the only limit point's there, and if I stay away from this point, then what's left outside is uniformly isolated. So this is a space which satisfies all these properties.
Okay, so we want to know, again, the question I'm looking at here is when uh, uh, the Bourbaki key bounded sets, no, the, the totally bounded sets coincide with the um, uh, infinitely non-uniformly isolated sets. So we have three conditions. The first is what I just mentioned. The second condition is that the con uh, uniformly continuous functions form a ring and the totally bounded sets uh, coincide with the Bourbaki key bounded sets. Uh, that's pretty much from our previous theorem. But in terms of UC spaces, uh, a necessary and sufficient condition is this one. The completion, the metric completion of the space is a UC space. And you can uh, find various uh, characterization of spaces with UC completions in a, a survey paper by two Indian mathematicians, uh, Kundu and Jane from New Delhi. Okay, so uh, a, a guy from Rouen named Bouziad and his student, who I think is from the Czech Republic, Sukacheva, got a hold of uh, the Cabello Sanchez paper and our paper and then made some further progress. And this, this is something I'd just seen in a, in a preparent. Uh, and I like, they have a bunch of, uh, actually they're, the, the, these, uh, the idea of, uh, uh, you know, one is a product of real valued functions, uh, uh, unif uniformly continuous. Uh, uh, it's really a question for about uniform spaces. I mean, it can be considered there. And, and they, they make, they give answers for uniform spaces which uh, satisfy a certain game theoretic condition. And, and they they prove uh, uh, these they prove prove these two properties. I, I want to look at the first one. The first one is really cool. So this is again nest, the first condition is necessary, and I should say their spaces do include the, the metric spaces as a special case. So uh, the first condition says that if I have a uniformly continuous function. real value function, and I follow it by a continuous function from R to R, then it stays uniformly continuous. That's really a nice condition. I wouldn't call that an eternal condition, but it's really a nice condition. So, so, I, so I like this. And uh, the second condition is, I think, a little less interesting. Uh, but uh, I, I have some other things I could say, but uh, as we say in the United States, enough already. Do you know this expression? Okay, thank you. <laughs> I'm happy to be on the other side of the camera. Many times, I, I have a camera like this at home, and so, so I film my wife uh, very frequently while she's <laughs> practicing for auditions and things. <laughs> I'm serious. Yeah. There, there is a Hollywood. <laughs> Any any questions? Any question? Comments? Uh, may I uh, ask? Uh, um, somehow uh, uh, there are different concepts of uh, bandit. Uh, yes. Yeah. So um, does it uh, induce uh, different uh, conversions? Um, types uh, on bandit sets, so uh, because uh, the, the topology of yes. the uniform conversions. Yes. Okay. So I'll, I'll give you. This is a. He, you see, he, he has a really good, a really good uh, uh, question. What? So his question is, uh, you know, we could talk about uniform convergence on bounded sets, which which you're personally interested in, yeah, and yeah. a lot of people are interested in uniform yes, convergence. Yes. So you may ask for uniform conversions on uh, other kinds of bornologies, like weakly compact sets. So we're not talking about functional analysis here, 
or on finite sets or on things like this. And so one of the theorems that I have lots of papers on this stuff, but, but uh, one of the papers that I first wrote on this for, for linear operators between norm spaces, I look at various topologies of uniform convergence on Bornologies. I think the, the one, the condi there's one condition in there is that the, uh, if, the, if I have a set in the Bornology, then if I take the, the star shape hole, uh, I take the star of it over the origin. I, mean, I, I, take, I want the origin to be in a kernel of a, y you understand what I'm saying. It's not a convex hole, but I'm taking all line segments joining the origin. Uh, I want that to stay in the Bornology. Yeah, so, so the, 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 the idea of, of having convex hull being in there is, is too strong. There are a lot of Bornologies that aren't stable under taking convex hull, closed convex hull or whatever, you know, just, just not. But if you have this, then, then the uniform convergence of linear operators on Bornologies can be expressed in terms of a certain set theoretic idea of convergence on the graphs of the functions. So, so, you know, like you're always drawing pictures and analysis, but never really proving things with pictures. But the idea is, if the functions converge in this way, then, then uh, you can express that in terms of the graphs converging in a certain kind of way. That, 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 so there, there are many, uh, uh, yes, the answer is yes, so I just, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. I, I, I have, but uh, probably it could be a good question. But uh, if you have a function uh, which is zero at zero, uh, and you consider, for example, f of x over x, the oscillation of this function around oh, zero f of x over uh, x? f of x over x. Oh, yeah, 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 okay. And 0 over 0 equal to 0. Oh, okay. Uh, the oscillation of around 0 of such a function could have something to do with the Lipschitz property. I actually haven't, I haven't, I haven't thought about that. I haven't thought about that, about that specifically. So, so just to, to, to connect these two. Okay. Yeah, that's, yeah, I'm sure there's something to be said about this. But, uh, okay. So, it's, uh, uh, more questions? Okay, so thank you again. Thank you.